and welcome back as we stated prior to the commercial break uh, we have been joined by the honorable patrick faber he's the minister of education he's also the party leader elect of the udp good morning good morning to you sonny good morning marlene and good morning to all the viewers open your eyes uh, let's begin first of all by perhaps sharing with the country your feeling this morning it's a wonderful feeling, you know, I, um, I'm happy to serve the people of the UDP and of course I'm happy to serve the people of the country and it is a wonderful feeling this morning to be able to uh, address folks as the maximum leader of the party, you know, um, that's my lifelong ambition in terms of my service and so uh, it's, it's a wonderful feeling this morning. I think that's, that's a critical point that I, I wanted to start off with. Looking at, you know, you're a man who had a dream, and yesterday that dream was fulfilled, getting you one step closer to being the leader of the country. But it certainly wasn't an easy journey. Um, and if we go back to the point of the defeat just five months ago, um, talk to us about what process you had to undertake in working with representatives and delegates to get them to change their minds. Well, I think that there was no doubt uh, even from then that I had the capabilities and qualities to lead the party. Yeah. Um, I think that after that convention, certainly everybody knows that the environment changed mm -hmm. with the situations that happened uh, after the convention, shortly after the convention. And so uh, for members of our party, and especially for those delegates, they were uh, thinking then of just how we could get a leader that had the qualities that could lead us through. And there were many who thought that uh, Honorable Saldiva was not able to do that. And so it became a natural process from there for people to say, okay, well, um, while some of us supported Minister Saldiva the last time, mm -hmm. this time around, this time around, we are going to ensure that, that um, we go with somebody who we know can take us uh, into the elections uh, without that kind of trouble. Yeah. One of the questions I wanted to ask you on a, perhaps on a personal level, in the wake of the defeat of February 9th, how did you go about picking up the pieces and once again offering yourself for candidacy in the events that happened thereafter? Well, you do know that that was a process. In fact, the media kept kept asking me every chance uh, immediately after that whether I would put my hat back in the ring. Mm -hmm. It was a very difficult decision to make. Um, for me, there were, uh, there were lots of things going on. Um, I had to contemplate whether you know, this was the kind of overall rejection. Uh, mm -hmm. You know that there were uh, some difficulties with my colleagues right after uh, that situation as well. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was a very uh, discerning process whether uh, I wanted to continue or not mm -hmm. but people wouldn't let me say no uh, those who supported me uh, were wide in terms of the party and in terms of the country as well and people mm -hmm. kept saying listen you cannot give this up uh, it's not only about what you are feeling it's also about the fact that we do need a leader and you uh, appear to us to be that kind of leader mm -hmm. for the country and for our party and we need a fighting chance uh, whenever those general elections are called and you are the only guy who can get us there. Did you ever ex anticipate that you'd be facing the very same race that you did in February? You know, I did not. I did not. And I, I, I thought that those initial moments after February 9th or maybe later on in that week that uh, there would be some kind of other challenge, but I never anticipated that. I, um, I felt that um, Minister Saldiva would not have taken back on the challenge, and certainly the party may not have allowed him to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, many believe that that would have been a smart thing for the party to do. But in retrospect, um, even if I had lost, it would have been, for me, uh, a proven opportunity with a wider mm -hmm. base of the party to determine uh, what the people wanted, what the people in the party wanted. Mm -hmm. um, the convention then allowed for whatever doubts existed um, to say that, listen, so, and, and I want to commend Minister Saldiva because it's, it was a great showing as well. It mm -hmm. was not a walk in the park, I mean, to 
run away with the prize of the leader elect. And so um, I really um, commend him. And I think all of us are needed in the party uh, if we're going to make it to, to the victory. You know, the last campaign was, I think at one point it got really nasty. We saw a lot of stuff on social media, a lot of personal attacks taking place. And it led many to believe that there was a, a, a concerted effort, um, not necessarily to let Saldiva win, but to let you lose. Um, we, we saw where comments were made about your personality and how you, fun how you would be as a man in power. How much did you have to respond or to change people's thinking on how you were portrayed at that time? You know, this is not my first uh, convention, of course. That was not my first convention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my first convention was actually in 2010, so that was 10 years ago, and this is actually now my, I believe, my fourth convention. Okay. Yeah. And of course, I have been chairman of the party. I have presided over conventions and constituencies uh, too numerous to mention. I've been involved in other conventions. So for me, it was never personal. Uh, I tried not to engage with responding too much because I, kn I knew that we would one day have to put the pieces back together. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tried just to stay away from that. And I've been uh, in this game long enough to know that those things aren't personal, especially when it is inter, inter party mm -hmm. and um, that we can work it out. It's just just like anything else in the heat of, of a war, in the mm -hmm. heat of a battle, things are said and done uh, that aren't necessarily meant. Uh, they're, they're, they're said and done for a purpose, to achieve a purpose, and, mm -hmm. and it, you don't take it personal, you just move on. But so did you in fact feel that it was an effort to not get you elected? Absolutely, but that is what it is all about. There, mm -hmm. you know, the, the other side will work to get me uh, out, and I am working to win. So mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. We're now at a point where healing within the party is necessary. You're Absolutely. looking at that in the weeks ahead. When you look at what happened the first time around, and I, and I hate to go back to that, but perhaps it serves as a reference point here. When you look at what happened the first time around, and you look at the outcome of what transpired yesterday, you have been able to narrow the gap somewhat. But there is still work to be done ahead in terms of unifying the party going into the general elections. What will that process be like for you? Because I would gather that there are those who are firmly in your favor and there are others who staunch, staunchly oppose your leadership. That is true. And um, if you noted my comments yesterday, after the, immediately after mm -hmm. the convention, you would have noted me saying that it is the first order of business. Mm -hmm. um, we must, in very short order, unite this party. Um, and it's not to say that we are so badly divided that we can't put it back together, but after any convention, and you're right, even after the last convention, mm -hmm. there was not sufficient healing for us to say the party was completely united. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a process, and we made serious gains in terms of uh, putting our differences aside and saying, let's, let's work for the betterment of the party. And that becomes now an even uh, bigger priority after, after yesterday's convention. Uh, sure enough, some of those wounds were reopened, but um, I'm confident that we can get it together. And my agenda as the new party leader elect would be to work on those relationships right away, uh, giving, giving it a few days maybe for some people to uh, realize that, you know, this was just in the heat of the moment, the convention is over, but we will definitely move on and be strong about it. One of the things that I found um, somewhat interesting as an observation is that your political opponent had come forward with an economic recovery plan yes. in light of the COVID-19 situation that we're facing as a country. But I, I don't recall seeing or hearing anything from you that would address the way forward should you assume leadership. Um, do you have anything in the works in so far as being able to address the nation at some point with this particular plan of action? Absolutely. You will, you will understand that my opponent was in a different position from the position that I am in. Mm -hmm. He was outside of the cabinet mm -hmm. and he was struggling to ensure that he could uh, get people to understand that he has somewhere to go. Uh, my position was slightly different, of course. I'm still a member of the cabinet mm -hmm. and that uh, requires me, of course, to work along with my cabinet colleagues 
-hmm. and also the party's uh, po policy committee for us mm -hmm. to come up with strategies as to the way forward. In short, what I'm saying is it's a team effort. Mm -hmm. uh, the government, as you know, uh, has been working, uh, a committee has been working to come up with a recovery plan for COVID-19. I believe the work of that committee is now complete and they're uh, filtering to come up with the key points that we're going to uh, be talking about. And those uh, points will be led by me. So people will hear very shortly what the party's plans are mm -hmm. for economic recovery, but also what the national government's plan is for uh, in terms of economic recovery. So they, they can expect that. But I guess what I'm saying is I'm not a lone ranger in that, in mm -hmm. that sense. We are a mass party and we must uh, communicate to the people of this nation exactly what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. You know, four months from now, we could be having a general election. And you talk of, of having to come out of the con convention and giving some time for the party to be able to heal. Um, it means that you do have to win some people back over, convince them um, to be in full support of you and your leadership. Um, what do you think is, is the greatest barrier that you will have to break down for them? Well, I'll have to paint the picture of being a leader for everybody, I mm -hmm. think. And the thing is that makes that work easier is that we're all UDP. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the party believes in the party, everybody's fortunes are hitched to the same wagon, so to speak. And so we need to be working together and that's a common thread. So I believe that common thread will help us to understand that, you know, while we have our differences, even if it is there are those kinds of uh, dislikes, if you will, I'll be real about it, you know, these things exist, then uh, let us postpone that for a while. Let us ensure that the party uh, gets back into power. We are there for a fourth term, I think we, we have all the wear it all for us to make that happen. And then let's uh, think about our squabbles later on. Has what a plan been communicated to you uh, by Prime Minister Barrow as to what happens after the convention? Yes, um, the party leader and Prime Minister continues to be the party leader and Prime Minister up until the end of the term. Uh, all of us agreed that in fact, Prime Minister Barrow, well, has done a good job overall, but especially mm -hmm. in the COVID-19 situation. And of course, he being the person that he is, would not want to leave the ship, the country, in its uh, greatest time of need. And so uh, he is doing a great job of managing this situation. And uh, he remains in charge of the situation until he demits office at the end of our term. And that gives me the opportunity to focus on getting the party reelected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm building the party, unifying the party, organizing the party. That is my chief job at this time uh, as, the part, as the party leader elect and I'm going to take that job very seriously. The work of managing a party and managing a country is never easy in normal times. Mm -hmm. Imagine when we have such a crisis on our hands. So I am absolutely happy uh, to take on the role, one of the roles that, I, that I've signed up for, uh, which is now the to lead the party and I'll take that role very seriously while he continues to manage the government. Let me ask you a direct question here. Going into February 9th, <clears throat> it was rumored in some corners that there had been a falling out between yourself and the Prime Minister. And going into yesterday, it seems as though things had completely turned around and there was a mending of fences. What is your relationship like now with the Prime Minister as a party leader and, of course, with Cheyenne Barrow uh, as the, the candidate for Mesopotamia? Well, it's like with everything else, just like in families, sometimes we, we don't see eye to eye. We may not uh, agree with everything that each other does. But, you know, the important thing is to note that uh, we've never deteriorated uh, beyond the family. You know, we are a family. I have a lot of respect, in fact, I would say that Prime Minister Barr is my greatest mentor in, in my political life. And so there was never that level of, of disdain between, uh, between us. Um, uh, and he has, uh, in this last convention, said, I believe you are the best man and I'm going to give you the support, which he did, and I'm grateful for that support. It is 
uh, a part of the reason that I was able to succeed yesterday in the same manner in which last convention he said he thought that uh, that Saldiva was the better candidate and he mm -hmm. put his support silently behind him. Um, so th it, 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 the party leader is a main part of what happens in the party and he mm -hmm. does play a major influence and any party leader will have that influence. Uh, I'm hoping that that's the case because you have to be able to keep things together. Um, but I continue to admire the work of, of Dean Barrow. I continue to uh, uh, hold him as a very close friend. Um, mm -hmm. He um, and I go way back, as you know, uh, the rebuilding of this party from since our defeat, a uh, very bad defeat in, in 1998. Uh, we were in the doldrums together, and uh, I was one of the people who he uh, chose to help to build back this party. And so I, I will always treasure that, and I will always hold him as a dear friend uh, throughout the remainder of this term while he continues to be my boss. But even beyond that, there's a friendship uh, that I don't think any of what has happened will ever break. Uh, as for Shine, uh, you know that there were very uh, tense moments in the last convention. Um, and as I said, those things were for me, just a part of the war. It was very vicious in many regards, you are right. Mm -hmm. But I don't take those things personal. I've been in politics long enough to know that people don't even need to know you to attack you. Mm -hmm. uh, in the heat of battle, people will say things and do things. And um, it is up to you to be able to live with, with, with these things and be able to uh, shake it off your shoulder and move on. And I've been able to do that over the many years or learn that lesson of how to do that over the many years. How do you Let plan to address the pick stock situation where Sede Ellington has said, well, I'm not running under either of the two candidates were they to be successful over me. And so that's his, his exit, so to speak, from political life. Well, I'm still hoping that uh, this morning as people wake up to the reality uh, of the results of the convention that uh, there will be sober thinking. Um, so I, as of now, I don't take anything that was said before the convention as any kind of gospel. Mm -hmm. um, and my efforts, again, right away, immediately, is to reach out to all of my colleagues to mm -hmm. say to them, this is too important. Mm -hmm. The parties uh, need to win. And also the country's uh, need for good government means that all of us have to be uh, ready and willing and able and so I am hoping that um, that will be a realization for all of my colleagues and that um, we will be able to work it out. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the task at hand. You have a few months at the very least to be able to uh, prepare a campaign, um, execute it, get everyone on board in one of the strangest times in all of our lifetime. Um, given the fact that you were running for leadership, I'm sure you've put some thought into this. What is the, the proposed strategy for uh, your campaign moving forward? Well, I will try firstly to, as I've said, mend the uh, issues that we may have mm -hmm. in terms of differences among us. Um, and that's not only from the convention. There, there may be other issues that we will have to address in terms of bringing about party unity. There are issues that we have to address in terms of organization as well. Uh, even as I campaigned for this round of the conventions, for instance, I, I spent very little time uh, trying to convince people of who I am because I thought that I did that already um, for that February convention. And in fact, even before, I have been uh, the chairman of this party, the deputy leader, the deputy prime minister of the country. And so people basically knew what I'm about. They know the good and the bad, as I put it. They know what they're getting with me. And so I wasted no time in trying to uh, paint a picture of being capable or competent or whatever it is in terms of being the leader of the party. What I did do and with, w what I will continue to do is to say to the party, because remember, these delegates are uh, also the executive committees or for constituencies countrywide. So when you speak to them, you are speaking to the key movers and shakers. They are elected and they are given a task of being delegates, yes, but that's the smaller part of the task. The larger part of the task is to organize, energize the, the UDP in those respective constituencies. So I spent my time speaking to them and trying to energize them and motivate them to work, to make our machinery 
uh, over the next couple of months fighting fit and ready for election. So that's the plan in, 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 in basic words mm -hmm. to um, get the party ready for the election and I am pleased that I am able to, as the new party leader, elect focus on that now again while the Prime Minister focuses on the government. And I don't want people to think that I'm not taking very seriously my role as Minister of Education, Youth, Sports and Culture too, because that continues, the work with that continues. And there's very important work to be done in that regard as well, in terms of the fight uh, against COVID-19 and the reopening of schools for August 10th. Uh, there are many who, <laughs> I was reading some of the comments this morning, who are saying, okay, fine, you're party leader now, uh, get back to your, the business of um, managing education and, and, and go back and revisit your decision about opening schools on August 10th. Yeah. I'm hoping we can at least get some discussion on that before the end of this one. But, you know, it, it just naturally, in your decision making, even in reopening schools, you know that the context has changed. You're not going to be able to have uh, political rallies. Uh, you're not uh, looking at the type of financing um, that one usually gets before, a part, before an election. Um, these are very difficult issues with projections of it get, getting even worse. Um, how do you see a, a robust campaign being executed when people are unemployed, money is hard to come by, and there's just a general sense of cynicism and fear? That's an absolutely great question. Um, but like with everything else, it's a reality that mm -hmm. all have to face. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, not a, it's not a reality that only the UDP has to face either. Everybody who is in this race will face yeah. uh, such realities. So at least there is equal playing field. But uh, we're going to try to do our best in terms of getting the message out of the, of the party. I'm hoping that things continue to be uh, as normal as possible here in Belize uh, versus what is happening in the rest of the world and in particular our neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. And as long as that normal continues, we're able to gather in uh, smaller gatherings. Uh, the campaign can continue in that manner. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, the social media platforms are now very important to mm -hmm. get the message out not only to party supporters, but also to help to forge a kind of uh, view of the party, fit mm -hmm. for government that uh, people desperately need to know exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that's our plan in a nutshell of, get, of getting it out. But, but certainly, uh, as the party leader-elect, I will be moving around the country. There is no doubt. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we can escape that, save there is some uh, a greater outbreak of COVID-19, mm -hmm. and uh, it prevents me from doing so. Yeah. Now, what would you say to people that uh, would be your best selling point as to why you would be best fit to lead Belize out of these difficult times? Well, because firstly, I think that I possess this, the kind of skills that will uh, listen to the people. I think that's key for leadership. Uh, we have to address the issues, yes, but we have to first understand those issues very well. And for me, my experience has been over the many years that uh, the way to get to understand issues is, of course, to listen. Quite often we sit uh, in our offices and we, uh, we, we think we know the issues, but there's nothing like getting out on the ground. You remember, that's what I did when I first became Minister of Education, to understand the lay of the land. I started visiting schools and talking to teachers and parents and uh, school children before I started really on working on what needed to have been fixed in the education system. Uh, and it's the same for me in this role as party leader, but also uh, I'm aspiring for the job to lead the country. Mm -hmm. and, and while I've been engaged in many ways to understand already what these issues are, uh, a further learning process in terms of uh, this ultimate leadership position is needed and I'm working on that. So I, I will be engaged in that manner. You know, if, if we were to, to go off conventional wisdom, we know that um, some of the issues have been persistent in this country. Crime, corruption, those were on the top of everyone's priority list prior to COVID. And I assume they still are very big concerns. We also know the COVID situation and the unemployment spinoff that are also bigger issues right now. Let's talk about them specifically. You live in Belize City. Your division is in Collet. We know that uh, the south side at this time is under a state of emergency for what, the fourth? The yeah. fourth time? Um, and you hear the concerns, I'm sure, from parents in, in your area. What, what are your thoughts or what are your, um, what's your vision on how you would be able to change the situation of crime? 
Well, crime, uh, for me, and I've long said this, as one of the ministers uh, having to deal with social uh, situations, mm -hmm. that crime is not a problem that you can just fix by slapping in more police officers or putting up cameras or mm -hmm. whatever have you. Those things are very important, and I agree with that. But we need to fix the root causes of crime. And uh, that is why I've, I've, I've tried as best as I could over the years to try to ensure that educational opportunities are given to the most needy in this country because that can always be uh, a way to pull yourself up. Um, also, the family structure uh, needs to be fixed in this country, I think, where uh, we become each other's keeper. Uh, you've heard uh, many say, and I agree with fully, that parents have a bigger role to play in terms of determining how their children are going to come out in terms of uh, being productive or not in society. So. Uh, these are the things I think we have to get back. We have to get back to some of the very basics to ensure that our young men in particular are not out there uh, engaging in this kind of thing. And I, uh, I, I think what, what happens is that that life becomes very attractive for, for young people when, and when they can't find uh, somewhere in the, in the family to lean on, they find a family somewhere else. Mm -hmm. For me, that's the biggest issue that we need to address. But as we say, while the grass, the grow, the hash, the stuff, the stuff, we need to also be addressing aggressively um, the, 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 cr the criminal attacks out there. Mm -hmm. and, and so the state of emergency and things like that, I think, are very important as well to send the signal to criminals that we're not going to just sit back and allow this kind of thing to happen. Uh, we will take uh, control of the situation. And so that is where policing and the other issues become very important. Um, I think we can arrest the situation. The crime and violence uh, primarily plagues or, or urban areas. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a point that we constantly have to remind folks of when they try to paint a picture of Belize being uh, such a criminal haven. Um, it is very concentrated in certain areas and this is why the state of emergency is also very effective. But uh, I'm not saying that because we can just cordon off certain sections, mm -hmm. but because we know where the issues are, we can then uh, put in the social safety nets to capture the problems in these very areas. Belize City, by and large, is where this problem is, although we do have uh, spurts in other parts of the country. And so we should use the knowledge that we have in terms of knowing where the problems lie, not only to big stick and police, <coughs> but also to uh, to put in the, the safety nets that are needed so that we don't have to get there or that later on younger children coming up will not be in the same situation. When we look at, when we look at the issue of crime and violence from a sort of a geopolitical point of view, we look at your constituency for instance. It's a south side constituency where when you look at the other neighborhoods that fall within Collet, you have, for instance, the Ghost Town neighborhood, if I'm not mistaken. You have the Jerusalem area. All of these particular neighborhoods where they're a nest or a warren for crime and violence. And the question then becomes, what does the politician, in this case, what do you do in terms of dealing with your constituency and those issues? Because at the end of the day, they don't go away. If you don't address it properly, it creates a breeding ground for the younger generation to come from behind and, and perpetuate the same things. Well, it's just what I've said. We do what I've said just now that we mm -hmm. need to do on a larger scale, on a more uh, microcosmic scale. Mm -hmm. So in my division, you will notice I make no apologies for providing the greatest number of educational opportunities and support mm -hmm. so that uh, the the gang violence uh, road is one that uh, our people, I'm hoping, would less likely take as a result mm -hmm. of getting those opportunities. And those opportunities uh, are great. But as I've said, it's also that we try to do things that uh, foster the kind of uh, safety nets that people need. Mm -hmm. uh, my office, for instance, does a lot with young people. We do a lot with our churches. We have a uh, a, a group of about 12 churches that we meet uh, with the pastors and we yeah. plan and we work together. We do even home crusades together to try to help uh, the family to realize that, uh, you know, we're in this together and we can support each other. 
Uh, we do a lot for senior citizens. We do uh, also for uh, our, our regular citizenry. Uh, many programs coming out of my office, you know. So um, this is the little part that we can do, and I'm grateful to have uh, a wonderful person um, in, in the person of the Honorable Faith Bob, my predecessor in college, who knows uh, the work of politics and who is uh, such a kind heart to be able to be dealing with uh, those issues for me in my constituency office. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me ask one more question. What do you say to people who watch the situation of crime, specifically in Belize City, as it has continued over the years, um, where now people are being held for an entire month without being charged, young men, and all of the area representatives of these communities in the South Side are some of the most powerful ministers in this country. But the crime has only grown since you have held these posts. How do you respond to that? Well, it's a very loaded statement. I, I don't think that you can, you can uh, necessarily blame those representatives. But certainly there is um, a good reason for people to look to those representatives to try to help and address. And as I've said, I, I can tell you that in my own constituency, we try to address it by dealing with some of these root causes. But the, the, the pressures that our people are under, and we must understand that uh, there is a bigger, bigger uh, plan in action in terms of crime in Belize. Um, we, we, we sit smack in the middle of the the uh, drug trade and of course Belize is very attractive for plane landings and all of these other uh, mechanisms to get uh, drugs to the United States and so it forces uh, many situations on this country and <coughs> the most likely targets are, are uh, black and Hispanic people on the south side of Belize city it would seem. Uh, so it's not necessarily that there is the creation of these situations as a result of anything that the representatives on the south side do but it is a battle that we all have to fight and when I say that I mean the UDP and PUP representatives because we do have uh, both red and blue representatives on the south yeah. side but I mean it could be argued and, and you know you're an educator you know this when when the science and the research starts to indicate things you know it's fact um, and and it really is that the core of crime and violence comes from a lack of opportunity it comes from poverty, it comes from unemployment, it comes from failure in, in uh, adequate family support. Um, and these are things that in fact an, an area representative uh, can be charged with being able to assist in, in proper housing, in allowing for job opportunities, in uh, social safety nets. Uh, so again, it, it, it's not putting the blame, but you definitely had a responsibility and, or have and, a and, responsibility. And all of those things you've just heard me say, mm -hmm are uh, goals, certainly very e uh, effective uh, objectives that we've already uh, worked on, particularly in my constituency. But I know, for instance, uh, Minister Sede Ellington and his um, Samuel Haynes yeah. Center and all he tries to do there. I know Minister Tracy Panton, again, mm -hmm. uh, does a lot of social outreach and they try to their best. We try our best, um, but it's a tough situation. And what you've said uh, carries a lot of weight, I agree. Um, but it is a work in progress that, that we need to, to desperately continue. I agree. So let's, let's, move it, yeah. let's move it forward because I do want to talk about uh, the issue of corruption, which, as I said, prior to COVID may have been the biggest discussion we were having. There was talk of campaign financing. Um, we know we signed on to the UNCAC over a year ago. There's been limited movement there. In fact, uh, I, I would venture to say that um, a part of what happened, the falling from grace of... of the previous leader-elect really just highlighted the importance of the conversation. Where do you stand and what are your proposals in being able to address the issue of corruption in the country? Well, corruption overall, uh, I do have something to say about that, but before I speak on it in general terms, let me mm -hmm. specifically speak about campaign finance uh, reform that is needed. I, I fully endorse that and I think that we must uh, uh, try to understand where it is that we get monies from to run these campaigns. Mm -hmm. As we speak, a very popular billionaire is promising tens of millions of dollars, I'm understanding, if, mm -hmm. uh, to, to defeat the United Democratic Party if I would become leader. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, that is a very real situation. I'm understanding some of that money may have gone to my opponent uh, in order to make sure that I am not elected as leader of this party and leader of the country. So there are many games afoot uh, when it comes to monies that are spent uh, in these elections. And I am certainly all for uh, the, the, the kind of reform that will make uh, political parties accountable to the nation, uh, first to its members, but also to the wider nation, because we do get into uh, government offices uh, later on. So we must be accountable to all Belizeans to say where we get it, because I am of the firm belief, and I think all Belizeans will notice that when those people give you money, they want something in return. Yeah. They <coughs> definitely yeah. want something in return, and you, you cannot go out and and pledge the fortune of your party or of your government uh, without telling people exactly what it is you're doing. So I am all for campaign finance reform. On the larger issue of corruption, and as I uh, now take on this role as party leader-elect, let me say this, that um, my fight against corruption uh, in my own party and in the government uh, has been mostly from within. I don't get out and trumpet, and for obvious reasons, uh, it's just like when you have a situation or a problem in your home, uh, sometimes you need outside intervention, yes, but first you try to solve those problems from within. And so while people may not always hear me uh, speak out publicly against my party and my government in terms of acts of corruption inside and around the cabinet table and even in the, in, in the, uh, the parties machinery and mechanisms, they will hear me loud and clear because uh, I did not sign up for that kind of business. It is one of the reasons why when I offered myself for this post of leader uh, that many thought that I made a better candidate because I was able to say, listen, I've kept uh, free of corruption. I, I, I think people will definitely agree with that. There are those who say, well, you know, a politician, your T5 had those accusations and all, but that goes along with the, uh, with the territory. But uh, by and large, I have fought very hard over the years to ensure that my name is not one of those called in terms of corrupted acts in this country. So uh, I uh, firmly believe that uh, we can minimize corruption in the, in the UDP and corruption in the wider government. But w something that I said that always gets misconstrued mm -hmm. is that the Belizean population as well uh, you know, the U.S. government, I think, and the Love Foundation, it may be, has um, a campaign going on on the, on the radio and, and TV uh, to fight against corruption. And it's not only politicians. When we think about corruption, we, we think quite often, oh, it is the, the ministers of government. Yeah. Uh, corruption is across the board in this country, and we need to be dealing with those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, e even from the, the common person on the street who wants... Uh, to, to somebody to do something that is illegal or does not want to do something or that complies with the law. process. Right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is something that we have to fix in the Belizean psyche in general. And, and to me, therein lies the solution to our larger problem of, of corruption. But, it's, but, it, but it, is it, really it needs leadership. It's it policy needs leadership and guidance. You are yeah. correct. You are absolutely correct. And so uh, that, for me, is very important as well. And any government that I lead would would be addressing those issues and continuously because uh, you, you spoke about the UNCAC and um, you know there's a lot of bureaucracy in a lot of things. Um, that shouldn't be an excuse uh, whether complying to what they're saying uh, we should do. Uh, there are things though that we can do without uh, looking at all of those things which would probably make us look more in line or fall in line. Mm -hmm. We know what to do in terms of making things better. But are we willing as a people? The politicians can be there putting all the guidance, but when you have to do uh, things, in fact, leadership often requires making tough decisions that uh, people won't want to hear, don't want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all fine and well when it's only the politicians that have to implement something or do something that is going to make us less corrupt. But when it takes something that all of us have to do, yeah. then it becomes more problematic. Let, let, me, let me, you know. Over the years, we've heard most po all politicians give some <coughs> version of um, how they are anti-corruption. Uh, you know, sure. they talk about transparency, accountability. 
how do you differentiate yourself? Because we know signing the UNCAC is great, but we've seen how limited impact it had so far. We know that on paper, we have some really great accountability bodies, but in execution, they really don't help very much. Um, so how do you step up to the plate with a different message that ensures people that there is um, tangible solutions or policies or stance that will come from you as a leader? Well, I think much of that will come when, when you can actually get uh, something done, uh, when, when it's actually um, something you can see and mm -hmm. that, that is achieved. Um, uh, talk is cheap, but getting those actions completed, uh, it's very difficult in many respects for the reasons that I've mentioned. It's easier uh, said than done, and, and it, when it requires much more than politicians to do it, uh, people then don't want to engage. But it is an ongoing process in my view. Um, mm -hmm. And this, one, of the, one of the things we need to do is to ensure that we have the highest caliber of leaders, not only talking about the party leader or whoever is to be the prime minister, but also uh, at that level, setting the example, mm -hmm. uh, being able to say, listen, I'm not involved in that kind of thing. I would never jeopardize Belize's opportunities in that way. And then uh, finding good, competent, capable people at all levels of the government as well. We can start with cleaning up the government. And when I say that, I don't mean only uh, the cabinet. I, I mean all over. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, very daunting task. I will take that uh, very seriously. And we will try our best o over the time uh, to ensure that there are those kinds of tangibles that people can look and see. Oh, this is, they're not playing any games here. That's Before what. you go, can we segue quickly into the situation involving the reopening of schools? Mm -hmm. um, the Belize National Teachers Union has come forward to say that a majority of the schools may not be prepared or ready to open for August 10th for various reasons, including resources as well. Your comment? Well, as I've said on the record, I think you asked me that on Friday when you interviewed me in my office. Um, we need to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. We've been out of school and our children have been uh, deprived now of a face-to-face -face, uh, contact education for quite a few months now. And there is no dispute that that is not a good thing for our children. I don't think anybody can dispute that. And there are going to be persons and individuals and groups that don't agree necessarily with what uh, the government does or any decisions that the Ministry of Education makes. But the truth is that we have to start somewhere. And I want people to understand that safety is a, is a key priority for me and for my ministry. And that once we get to a situation where uh, there is the kind of community spread or any kind of other endangerment of our children, the very same way we did, I think it was on March 20th, uh, we, will, we will go back quickly to those measures to ensure the safety of our children. In terms of readiness uh, for parents and for teachers financially and otherwise to be back in the class, schools in general to be back in the classroom, I don't know that there is ever going to be a, a good time. And so I prefer for us to make an attempt, uh, even if uh, when we make that attempt, we don't achieve everything that we would want to achieve. At least we, we would know then that we would have started. Uh, we don't know what the future holds. In fact, it might, have, uh, it might have a worse situation for us. So let's make here while the sun shines, so to speak, here in Belize, because the situation isn't as bad as it could certainly be. A couple of things you said there. One, you said that if there is a community spread, we'd most likely see a closure of schools. That's what you're saying? Absolutely. Okay, secondly, you're saying that we should go ahead and do the best we can. However, that may actually require circumventing some of the safety procedures that we know um, are being asked of the general public. Uh, finance is a real issue here. You know, the schools are being asked to put in wash basins, hand sanitizers. They're not provided by management. They're not provided by the ministry. So then perhaps the parents or the teachers themselves may have to pay for it. Um, secondly, we're looking at a shift schedule. Most schools are moving in that direction or online schooling, which then puts an additional requirement for parents um, to be able to work out these types of schedules. My question is this, what type of support system have uh, you looked at to be able to help parents or teachers through this? The first is ensuring the safety procedures. The second is 
if my child's shift starts at 1230 and my boss says I can't leave, how do my kids get to school? And you what know, do they do from 8 to 12? You know, I want people to understand that there are no, uh, there's no panacea here. Yeah. Uh, this is new territory for everybody and the government, and this is, as is the case with the governments all over the world, we're faced with making some decisions that we've never had to make before. Mm -hmm. and, and in some respects, you don't know what the outcome of certain things uh, that, you, that you think will work uh, are going to be. So it's, it's very, very uh, thin ice in many respects. So I want people to understand that. Um, and while we make these decisions and we try to give support as best as we can, like with everything else, it, can't, it, it is not a situation where everything can be provided by the government. Uh, everybody is facing financial uh, distress, but so is the government. Mm -hmm. When more than 50% of your revenue, especially in those lockdown months, uh, was there, you know, we, we didn't get that kind of resource. So we're all in this together, battling it. Uh, there is no one magic pill that can fix everything. So we just need to hold on to each other and uh, try to do the best that we can. I, I suppose my question is geared towards whether or not the ministry in its capacity cannot have that sit down with the management of schools and talk about what they are providing. Because if it's not the teachers, it'll be the parents that'll have to provide it. Well, as and I, mm -hmm. sorry, as I, what, you remember when I made these announcements in a press conference, I made an appeal for the wider community to be involved. They accused the government then of uh, begging, so to speak. Uh, but my point at that time was that it's everybody's concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I made an appeal to the wider community. There are entities who may find it in uh, themselves to be able to help our schools. Um, the government does its part. We do a very big, uh, a big uh, support, if you will, to all of our schools, mm -hmm. and we try our best. Uh, I was in a hardware store, and I found two teachers buying uh, buckets uh, to, to, to equip their classrooms, and I did my little part there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is everybody trying to help, and I do take my hat off uh, to the teachers. They do. Uh, and especially in this time of preparing, I know that it's normally a very burdensome process for them. Uh, they want everything to be uh, perfect for the little children once they come in, and that's a, you know, that's a very noble thing of teachers, and I applaud them for doing so. But uh, the, the fix to that is for more people to do their part, and I make the appeal to managements as well, mm -hmm. because the government is in a partnership with these managements, and we are reminded of that. Uh, every occasion that the government tries to do something on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, so we appeal to them as well through their congregations, uh, most of them are churches, uh, through their congregations to try to step up to ensure that the children, the clients who they serve, who they uh, say to the, to the government and wider people, hey, we want a role in, in the formation of these children, then let's do our best for them. Everybody's business. And in conversations with uh, ministries of labor, in, in looking at perhaps offering parents some form of leniency, I mean, parents are trying to figure out what they do with their children um, when they're not in school now. Well, that's exactly what I mean. I mean, everybody has to, has to do their part. So um, we, we hope that employers, both in the private sector, and certainly we will have to look at that in the government sector as well, uh, we hope that there is that kind of leniency and support because right now, in fact, um, I had planned to be in Belmopan this week. My son's school, uh, school reopens today, mm -hmm. but he's on shift, so he goes Tuesday and Thursday. Mm -hmm. And so while one is in school, the other one is not in school. So what, what am I to do with one? They're, they're a tag team yeah. bunch, you know, so they, they, they look out for each other. But what is my other son going to do while the other one is in school? And then he... Uh, because he, we have to be here uh, to go to school, we can't go anywhere else, you know, around the country. So it, it is indeed a tough thing to do. Uh, and as I've said, I don't have uh, a magic pill to fix all of these issues, but I'm hoping that the fact that we're in this together and everybody understands that this is a pandemic that uh, we, fa we all face, mm -hmm. uh, we all can do our part to help to make it uh, a little bit easier and try to help somebody out. If you're an employer, there's a problem, help your employee out. If you're an employee and you can help your boss out that has to uh, open the store or something I I longer hours, help out because it is in this, these acts of kindness that we will get through uh, this bike together. We all have a role to play. Indeed. Yeah. 
All right, well, we are out of time. Um, but before we do, I just want to ask, so what's, what's next on the agenda? Who's the next person you'll be meeting with? Uh, well, this morning I have, unfortunately, a funeral um, for a cousin of mine, a little baby who unfortunately passed, and uh, I'll be going actually to Hattieville for a funeral. So, uh, but I, I will reach out to my colleagues. Uh, there are some who um, supported me, and of course I've already said thanks to them, but for me, the more important uh, calls that I have to make today are to those who I've not heard from. <laughs> and you know this is how it is but yeah. uh, we'll be okay as I've said uh, repeatedly about the UDP all will be well all right. All right. well thank you very much for coming in and having this conversation with us thank you too right. we're gonna go ahead and take a break and we'll be back in a few stay tuned